previously on Kerbal Collaborative Warfare. Glorious ally the Beardy Penguin releases his new war machine, the Phobos 3. Rescues Zombie Kerman from Area 51 and blockades captured base Hamburg Cape. Evil Nazi war criminal Tape, enraged by the destruction of his military assets, embarks on a series of brutal revenge attacks against Penguin's naval assets, ending in his pilot's death. <laughs> Meanwhile, closer to home, Agonarch of A Industry continues to rain terror and destruction upon the east coast of Cthulhu, taking out many vital toy and sweet production facilities. Will this horror ever end? This journalist thinks not. Hey guys and welcome back to Kerbal Collaborative Warfare, the version of Kerbal Space Program where we have taken the weapons of BD Armory and the bases of Kerb inside, split up those said bases into nations and handed them out to me and a few YouTube friends so that we can go to war in this illustrious space simulator. Once again this round we have to deal with the invasion of Agonarch. He has come along to the Cthulian Peninsula, found the East Coast as he has for three turns now, but this time instead of attacking Ben Bay he has taken over Kerman Lake. This is quite vexing to me as it is my nearest and greatest airstrip in the local area, but it's okay. A little bit further south we have Jebediah Sands down here and this is, or at least Jebediah Island, with Jebediah Sand, Jebediah Airport and I believe a heliport as well. We'll be using this base of operations to uh, head north and liberate Kerman Lake from the evil clutches of Chairman Agonarch. Thankfully, he did not actually put any defences up there. And using our local spy network, we have figured out that maybe this could have been because after taking over Kerman Lake, he decided to go north to try and take over Ben Bay, or at least to harry ben bay and destroy the defenses there unfortunately it looked like he had failed there seems to be some new wreckage at ben bay this is all good for me it means the weeble dalek did its job incredibly well right now we're just flying over the kerblantic making our way to kerman lake in fact we are even coming in within 20 kilometers now so we're going to take the speed of the footage down just a little bit for our landing here this vessel is quite a top heavy one you can see on the top here i have a goalkeeper. I quite like bringing goalkeepers to any fight that I'm in. With their 360 degree field of fire and their just absolute massive rate of bullet throwing out, uh, I find they are by far one of the best weapons to have if you have control of them. Not so good when the guard menu is uh in control okay so we're coming down quite fast over the top of this runway here i did have a little bit of trouble couldn't quite slow down as much as i really wanted to here and we are pointed just a little bit off the side this vessel also not the most stable in the world i'm not sure quite what i had done wrong to make it so uh so unstable I, I should imagine it's mostly to do with the top heaviness and how close together these wheels are this, of course, is absolutely no problem for our crack team Stilty and Jedbass. They, of course, just taxied their way down the Kerman Lake runway with no challenge. No challenge at all, until eventually they got down towards the flag, swapped it out, and called this base liberated. Woo! Praise leader! This, of course, seems like the perfect time to go across to Ben Bay and see exactly what had happened. I thought I'd let you guys see here. Uh, so, yeah, we swift switch our view over to the bit of orb weaver dev debris over there. And as soon as we load in, I noticed that the uh, the Weeble Dalek was just kind of floating in the air. That That's a bit of a weird thing. But it still seems to be completely operational. So we'll have a few moments just skipping around, seeing all the uh, detritus of Agonarch's many, many attempts to try and take over Ben Bay. Uh, it's quite amazing. Amazing. Quick check over the uh, the Weeble Dalek here, looks fine. And if we zoom out a bit, here is Agonarch's last attempt to try and have a go. Over the hill, inconveniently, but if we zoom out and start just taking one or two un, uh, unguided pot shots, uh, if we let the bullets fly, the spray will take a few bits out. Just trying to clean up the debris around, really. Uh, but yeah, let's put this back on guard mode and get back to what's actually going on. Because, you know, this works fine. We're going to leave him here. Good evening. We're receiving special reports concerning the aftermath of the Battle of Bembe. It seems there have been another conflict between the glorious forces of Cthulhu and the perpetual rebel invasion army of Agonarch Industries. Here with a special report is Kerb Kerman. Kerb? I'm standing on what used to be the site of a child's toy factory on the eastern coast of Cthulhu. Now, the smell of gunpowder and burnt flesh fill the air. 
As for reasons yet unknown, the evil Chairman Agonach has decided that he wants this land above all others. I have with me today Wilgie Kerman, the only pilot known to survive a full frontal assault from Agonach Industries. Wilgie, a few words? Ah, it was easy, right? All I had to do was wait until the blipping thing got inside the circle, just pulled the trigger at the right time and everything was alright, right, right? You know, I thought it was a little bit scary, but with Dear Leader behind me and telling me that everything was going to be okay, I just knew that it was going to be alright. Glories to Dear Leader! Glories! As you can see, excitement is running high here, and with the recent string of victories, all thanks to the glory of Dear Leader, of course, who can blame them? Kerb Kerman, Ben Bay. With all that unfortunate business taken care of, it is time to bust out a new piece of technology. We have here, of course, the GLDV Low Profile. That is the Glorious Leader's defensive vehicle, Low Profile. Uh, it's basically going off of the Weeble Gut Dalek's base model, but there seemed to have been a bit of issue with the missiles around the inside that were surrounding the power core that it had. So I've taken those out, I've laid them flat. This might give us a few issues with, try with trying to clear buildings while shooting at them, but I'm hoping that's not too much of a case. Uh, the other problem I have is the ground clearance is quite low here. So trying to get over just a little ridge that is on the edge of the runway was more than a little bit of an issue here, uh, as well as trying to roll around without like smashing the tip of my missiles into anything but anyway after mucking around with it quite a lot we end up getting it into position right at the very end of the base not at the end of the runway but just off on the side somewhere this is the position where i found that we had most clearance for all the rockets with the defensive positioning in place, it's time to get out this vehicle again. We are going to go try and take care of the threat of Agonarch, if not once and for all, at least show them that we are serious about trying to defend this place. So this vehicle here has uh, a bit of a weird turning circle. Unfortunately, the landing gear at the front didn't have any sort of steering capabilities, and the landing gear at the back kind of had a bit too much steering capabilities. Uh, in testing more than once when I was making one of these harsh turns here I ended up folding my, well not folding flopping my wings onto the ground and taking out missiles and stuff it was more than a little bit vexing but eventually we got to this perfect takeoff position here and just racing down the hut, the runway as hard as we can I did then think back to how much trouble we had getting off of the Jebediah Island airport uh, and I was thinking that maybe Maybe we won't make it here, but thankfully, about three quarters of the way down the runway, we managed to take off like a graceful swan, slapping its, uh, its way off the surface of the water. Now, what are we going to take this vessel to do? Well, so far during this conflict of the Cthulian coast, most of the time I have been merely reacting to Agonarch. She's taken over some stuff, I've had to go and take it back, and I've kind of run out of the number of bases that I can do stuff with. But with him now concentrating on the moon, I've decided now may be the time to take a real stab at his heartland. So we're going to take off from Kerman Lake, and we are going all the way to, ben, uh, to Blue Bay. This is... A phenomenal distance. I, I can't really give over how how long this was, for, especially for a craft as small as this. Uh, you remember that we had uh, Ben Bay and Bit Sandy we used to be the place where they took off from. Where if you go to Bit Sandy and then go one and a half times as far on the other side, you end up in Agonarch's territory. And I am headed for Blue Bay. Just because, you know, it's one of the ones that I keep on getting mixed up between Ben Bay and Blue Bay. So I thought it'd be good to try and take that over there. My technique for crossing continents, I'm sure, is no different from yours. I found out in previous testing what was the ideal uh, altitude to have this, these engines working out. Turned out it was about somewhere between 15 to 20 kilometers. So I, with that in mind, I took off at about a 45 degree angle until we got up to 12, 13 kilometers. When I started nosing down towards the horizon, looking to be about level, about 16 or 17 kilometers. I then just started going as fast forward as I can, reaching speeds of one a half maybe even pushing 1.6 kilometers burning up in the atmosphere until my engines just couldn't go any further when they started burning out asymmetrically because you know that's the way engines do i started dropping down my throttle until eventually i was at the point where i was giving such little thrust that i couldn't actually sustain my forward velocity here uh, you can see here i have taken down my throttle almost all the way this is to make sure that we don't have that asymmetric thrust as i was talking about now i'm just waiting for my speed not to bleed off but to, for my more for my altitude 
to drop down low enough for us to be able to pick up the uh, flight again. This single high altitude jump got me all the way across to Bit Sandy. This was amazing. I managed to make it all across to Agon Arches in a second jump. And in fact, I think we're going to jump ahead now, as you have seen the technique that I did, did here. Uh, the only thing of note to say is when I was coming down into the lower altitudes, I made sure that I was pointed at Blue Bay so that when I fired up my engines again, I could then start pulling up, knowing that I'm pointing in the right direction. So with that high altitude arc taken care of, we find ourselves coming down deep within Agon Arches territory. Just to the left there we can see Blue Bay, the per place I am aiming for, and the flag up ahead of us is the KSS Kerminsov, the uh, aircraft carrier that Agon Arches has taken off of Velox quite early in the campaign here. I'm aiming for the little bit of an isthmus in between the bay that we're currently flying over and that almost crater-like lake in front of us. This is because I have been carrying a payload underneath my craft for a very long time now, since I first launched off at Jebediah Island. And my plan for attack at Blue Bay involves dropping this payload just outside of fire range of the Orb Weaver. Because an Orb Weaver, no matter what the version number, is a formidable and intimidating defensive structure to try and make my way in there. And I don't think uh, flying a plane is the way to go against any Orb Weaver. I tried for many turns to launch jet-based attacks against Orb Weavers and it just didn't work. The thing that has been going well for me has been tank attacks. Uh, so... I have been developing a tiny, tiny little tank that I think will be playing quite a, quite a part in my future expansion of territory. And we can see here right on the very edge of what that orb we would be able to shoot at. I dropped the payload and we are now going to go try and find ourselves a landing spot. I don't even want it to be far away. I want it to be like relatively close to be able to strike at a moment's notice. Or at least come along and mop up anything that this little tank that could didn't actually end up doing okay so uh, I'm doing my standard let's slow down by turning 180 degrees and come down at the ground just maybe a little bit too fast I'm keeping my eye on the flat slope ahead of me and that's when this hill just kind of came out of nowhere but everything's all right we've managed to put down on top of it but unfortunately little bit of twist in the land plus the braking managed to make my plane fall over to the side not too bad though uh, I lost some missiles that was a little bit unfortunate but all in all, the plane is still operational. Okay, so over here we have the tiniest tank. It is literally the tiniest tank that I could possibly imagine uh, putting together. And we are going to try and make our way across all these hills. Uh, the wheels underneath, I'm going to make the front wheels powered wheels. and the, No, sorry, the back wheels powered wheels. And the ones at the front are going to do all the steering. This way we are going to be the most uh, stable we could possibly be. You will see that I have a couple of landing legs on top. That is for a Shremek mechanism, you know, self right it's uh, very much a thing when you're driving around such a tiny tank. My plan with this tiny tank is pretty much the same as it was with the shredded galash going over towards Bit Sandy. Uh, I'm going to try and make myself uh, visible over the crest of a hill without, or sorry, I'm going to make him visible by sitting on the crest of a hill without him being able to fire at me. That is my my. Uh, plan anyway and with this sped up footage you can see how I'm approaching this situation we're literally just driving along the little strip of land that I was showing you from a distance trying to crest the hill as high as possible but hopefully with a low enough profile and a high enough angle of attack to make me uh, a truly offensive being so here we are on top of it I just took a, a quick note of uh, zooming out to see if I could reach uh, and unfortunately I don't think I actually could there was a, a small hill in the way we're going to try popping off some shots but thankfully the targeting reticule tells us that we can so slowing down my footage here so we can see what's going on I launch off a single volley uh, from that sort of angle from being able to see from my angle and then I realized I wasn't really gonna get the best uh, attack angle at doing that so I come around here zoom out take a look from the orb weavers point of view and do my best to fire over the howitzer rounds to just kind of pop in the face Thankfully, there doesn't appear to be any return fire coming from this, so everything looks incredibly good for me. There were many pieces came flying off of the Orb Weaver, and I think now it's probably weak enough for us to go and have a small look and see if, you know, we blew it into enough small bits to no longer be a threat to us. 
So the final f approach across the beach is met with uh, a few howitzer rounds just to make sure nothing had actually like returned fire at me at any point. So I felt like I'd taken out any sort of offensive capabilities of this when we were still up on top of the hill. And getting like within 200 meters here, I think we can safely assume that this is uh, just a pile of scrap now. Right, so from here, it's time to take the plane off and get us back. This is going to be our uh, defensive structure for this base. Now that I stop and think about it, I really would have liked to have left the little tank that could maybe up on a hill somewhere a little bit further away than where I actually left it. But, you know, these are the prices we pay for, like, being in the moment and not really thinking about things before we leave them. But anyway, the flight across was quite uneventful. We had to just dodge a hill. That was uh, relatively easy to do. I really did think I was going to ditch it into the water at some point here, but everything was kind of okay, and then we put down nicely on our brakes here. Uh, one thing that I always like to do when I've got a goalkeeper in tow is, of course, cleaning up uh, the debris that I leave lying around. The debris is one of the things that makes uh, the lag just totally unbearable. So whilst I have the uh, the goalkeeper here, why not just go around, blow up a few missiles, try and take out things, and actually find out what's uh, invincible and what isn't. Uh, generally, if it touches the floor, it seems to be invincible. Wheels and skids and things like that all seem to be the hardest thing to blow up, uh, as well as the uh, infernal robotics hinges. They're, they are also quite hard to shoot. This, of course, leaves us with just a few formalities to take care of. The first, of course, taking down Aganarch's flag. The second, of course, erecting my own. Dear Leader is always proud to witness a flag get erected tall and proud on someone else's base here. Blue Bay, of course, the one we have taken over. My other piece of formality is, of course, back at Bit Sandy. Whilst that base is still firmly under our control, Aganarch did take out any sort of defensive structure that was there. So we are going to uh, reapply the Weeble Dalek. Uh, I know there were some uh, exploding middle problems to go with this, but we have done a few little tweaks to it. I've moved all my, my rockets out and about, I've moved the armour out, and I have put wheels on the underside, so we can actually put this in a slightly better position. And with that, I am going to say thank you very much for joining me for this adventure, guys. I will see you next time where we're going to deal with Agonarch. Happy hunting, and all glories to Leader!